Sudunga nga tong dakbayan Nanginahang lang Pugtabang Nagbago ud sa kadaghan Sa kalisod nga Kisaguba Punta di na nato ni Pasagdan Walay di masulbat kong tanan Magkahiusa lang Sa pagpagkamala Yudang atong kaluwasan Kayang gahong anaasa katawan Kinsa pa man di ay ang magdi na bangay Kinsa pa man di ay ang maginunungay Kinsa pa man di ay ang
Hi, I'm Ian. Want to live extraordinarily? It may seem difficult, but with Cebu Landmasters, it's possible. Let me show you. First, they give you hands-on service. From their sales and customer care team, prior and during turnover, to their in-house property management team, when you've settled in. Plus, their amenities are carefully planned and well-developed. Like a clubhouse with pool, a gym, and even a chapel. You can choose from a wide range of developments. Residential, offices, mixed use, townships, and even hotels. Everything for the lifestyle you want. With over 50 developments in the best locations, Cebu Landmasters is now the leading local housing developer in key Vismin cities. So you see, you can live extraordinarily when your real estate developer goes to great lengths for you. Live extraordinarily with Cebu Landmasters. Things keep getting better because the sun you've loved is now smart. The sun brings in a new day and everything changes. Get used to a more seamless prepaid experience. Load via smart retailers, the GigaLife app and the online store. Say hello to even more promos, events, deals, and partnerships under SMART. Make the most of your Giga with even more Giga promos suited to your needs. And don't worry, you get to keep your SUN mobile number as you move on to SMART, the country's fastest mobile data network. Now you see why? Welcome to SMART! Welcome to the Giga Life. Your passions, your stories, your life. Simplified with just one app. This is the future. The Giga Life in just one app. Experience more Giga moments when you make the smart choice. With the Philippines' fastest mobile data network. How do I know it's T1? Simply smart echo. Try this. Oh, 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 oh. Wait, let's make this extra. Ta da! <laughs> Making spicy tofu stew? This works best. Oi, Gising! Oi! Just because we need to keep our distance doesn't mean we have to stay distant. Stay close to your passions with free stories for all. Get 14 gigabytes for Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter for just 99 pesos. Share your passions. Share your stories. Download the GigaLife app and choose free stories.
Welcome to day two of Cebu Design Week 2020. Here I am again, Kay Batikin, hosting live from the living area of Holy Cow Gallery Store in Crossroads Mall. The video we saw just before the countdown features the Cebuano Performing Arts community as they come together for the first time since the lockdown. Cebu Design Week and the National Commission for Culture and the Arts believe in the local performing arts industry and want to support this sector that has been especially affected by the current challenges. In a collaborative production of Two Tin Cans Philippines Incorporated with the Sinulog Idols Guangming Institute of Performing Arts and Queen Cebu, featuring Monica Cuenco, Ralph Maliarpre, Philip Mancol, Zayardi Ramos, Coco Caballes, Yesha de La Calzada, Tatos Kuya Bryans, Bisaya. Since its conception three years ago, Cebu Design Week has advocated for the creative industries and communities here in Cebu. In October of 2019, it was a realized communal victory as Cebu officially became a UNESCO creative city of design. The pandemic has abruptly set back and postponed a lot of what we had planned as a follow through, however. A design problem. How do we adapt to this new situation and still push through with our plans for Cebu Design Week. To give us a background on how Cebu Design Week has adapted to the present challenges and to formally welcome everyone, here's Ms. Mary Booth, CDW Overall Chairperson. Welcome to Cebu Design Week 2020, the great recreate. Threatened by the economic fallout of a global pandemic, we are called to recognize new paths identify new leaders, and formulate a new vision. After the pandemic hit, we took a hard look in the mirror and asked ourselves, what are we here for? Our mission is to connect, create, and cultivate a network for design. We decided this year is not the year for us to call a retreat from that mission, especially after we won acceptance to the United Nations Creative Cities Network in November 2019. So with our now very limited budget, we did what all Cebuanos are famous for, doing more with less. We reached out to our creative network and developed our Creatives in Quarantine, Stay Home, Stay Creative Facebook series, a lively and inspiring series of short videos with stories of creativity and resilience by Cebu designers. We then turned our attention to the manufacturers and exporters of Cebu with our hashtag what Cebu can do series. The resulting videos made during the quarantine are a testament to the quality of Cebu exporters. And we continue to expand the world of Cebu design through our affiliation with the Cebu UNESCO Creative Cities of Design Committee. As the virus continued its assault on our capacity to gather, we faced a difficult decision. What to do with Cebu Design Week 2020? Again, we decided that our creative network had ideas to share, advice, tools, and information to get Cebu going again. Cebu Design Week 2020, the great recreate was born. We'd like to thank our sister organizer, Cebu Furniture Industries Foundation, Inc., our government sponsors, the Philippine Department of Trade and Industry, the Philippine National Commission for Culture and the Arts, the Philippine National Commission for UNESCO, the Office of the Presidential Assistant to the Visayas, and the cities of Cebu and Mandawe. Our co-presenting sponsor is Smart Communications, and our omnibus sponsor and Cebu Design Week 2020 official real estate partner is Cebu Landmasters. Special thanks go out to Congresswoman Lollipop Wano Dison for supporting the creative sector of Cebu. More than anything, we want to thank our trustees and the Cebu and Visayas creative community for keeping faith in what we do and supporting us with their creative output. We thank you, our audience, for giving us your time and attention. We hope you will be inspired and come away with some tools for your own journey and go into the world to create, cultivate, and collaborate for a better world. 
Thank you very, very much for that warm welcome, Mari. She reaches out to us from the U.S. where she is currently with family. As Mary mentioned, Cebu Design Week has rolled out programs from as early as May of this year. That was in the middle of ECQ for Cebu City. So let's watch this short video. When we started Cebu Design Week, we wanted to connect people, encourage everyone to create, and cultivate the landscape of creativity and innovation. Expect to see new content on our social media pages, a virtual platform for creatives to sell their products and services, and other digital programs we will run to support creatives and those affected by the current situation. CDW 2020 may be one of the most innovative and meaningful undertakings we are going to be doing in a very long time. Connect, Connect create. create. There is so much we can accomplish together as a community. Community rebuilding is indeed what we'll be looking at for this year's theme, The Great Recreate. COVID-19 continues to sweep the world in a frenetic sprint for damage control, bringing to the fore pre-pandemic weaknesses and accelerating megatrends at an unprecedented pace. There is a need to assess and reevaluate the role of creatives at large and how, more than ever, design and the arts are essential to moving forward. Cebu Design Week aims to spotlight key pivot elements from different angles, all relevant to creatives from any industry. Under the overarching theme, there are five sub-themes for the Design Summit sessions. Asa na si Lapu-Lapu, or where is Lapu-Lapu, which was yesterday afternoon. It was very intense, and it really warmed everyone's hearts. Today, taking from that, we will be tackling opportunity from adversity. The morning session will involve individuals and creatives, which will be it's our current session. And this afternoon will be organizations and enablers. So it's a more macro view. Tomorrow... The themes are rethinking tomorrow. So how do we move on now that we kind of know what to do? Where are we headed? In the morning, it will be institutionalizing creativity. And in the afternoon, emerging futures. So these are the morning and afternoon sessions, respectively. Today, our theme is opportunity from adversity, from the perspective of individuals and creatives. It is friction and pressure that shapes most materials, as we, we creatives know, and the days we wake up to feel like sandpaper. So how do we shape ourselves in these challenges? Let us hear from creatives who have been able to upskill, pivot, and reboot. Learn how to leverage the power of design to solve problems, and make life better. We have marketing experts, talking about buying trends and what customers are lo looking for. With so many aspects to consider, here are some of the more relevant ones. So you can have a takeaway and bring it to your own context. I'm sure everyone is excited to hear from the speakers. We have four this morning who will share their experiences like case studies amid the present challenges, after which we will have the panel discussion where we will open the floor for questions. So if you've got something you want to ask, hang on to it and you can ask it when the time comes. So let's begin. Our first speaker started as a fashion accessories exporter, eventually becoming CEO of Russ and Berry Corporation. 90s kids will be very familiar with this, the maker of a troll's doll. She's an author, philanthropist, and the president of the Russell Berry Foundation. Let me call on screen. Miss Angelica, Angelica Berry. Good morning, ma'am. Okay. There we are. Hello, good morning. It's a pleasure to be speaking to Cebu exporters as a fellow Cebuana born in La Hogue and also an exporter from over 30 years ago making paper mache jewelry. Being an exporter led me to interesting places in my life. 
one of my buyers was Raspberry and Company, whose founder Russ I met and married. Saitam at that time brought consultants like Paula Navone, founder of the Mepi School of Design, and other designers who taught us to use international color forecasts and interpret design trends. Exporting prepared me for my next life with sales entrepreneur Russ Berry, who made his fortune selling teddy bears and trolls, which fueled our philanthropic adventures. From being a vendor, I switched hats when I joined my husband's global gift company. At 47, I was widowed, became CEO and vice chair of a public company on the New York Stock Exchange. Paper has been a passion and a thread of creativity in my life. After the company was sold, I became a paper entrepreneur, acquiring Kate's Papery, an iconic specialty paper retailer in New York, and Boston International, a gift importer and distributor of IHR paper napkins from Germany, which can be found in Bed Bath & Beyond, Target, TJ Maxx, Party City, and mom and pop stores. These are some photos of Kate's Papery, which carried handmade paper from different countries, including the Philippines. In my other life, I'm president of the Russell Berry Foundation, which has funded cultural centers like Angelica and Russ Berry Performing and Visual Arts Center at Ramapo College in New Jersey, a future performing arts center at the Betzala School of Arts in Jerusalem, as well as the Israel Museum, Crystal Bridges Museum in Bentonville, Arkansas, the Jerusalem Arts Biennale, and the Jerusalem Season of Culture, which is a festival of art, music, and cultural experiences that inspired me to bring some ideas home to Negros. I grew up in Bacolod. A few years ago, I embarked on a cultural mission, renovating the Negros Museum as a gift for my mom's birthday. Then I thought we needed a mascot to attract tourists and commissioned a five-ton carabao to reside in front of the museum. The art installation depicting scenes in colorful mosaics of life in the Sugarland, harvests, sacadas, ascenderos, the Bacolod Cathedral, and Hacienda Rosalia. You can check out the making of Bao, the unbowed carabao, on his own Facebook page. My cultural journey continues with the launch of the Negro Season of Culture. On November 5, a digital platform connecting cultural organizations with the heritage and history of the province, woven into a cultural narrative of our traditions, handicrafts, local cuisine, heritage homes, cultural experiences. I hope this effort will translate into a regional brand. I would like to see an ecosystem where culture meets commerce, creativity stimulates growth, jobs, a tourist and consumer economy. In the US, three states, Arkansas, Colorado, and Mississippi have used an industry cluster model. I call it a super creative core of creative individuals, institutions, and businesses that include not only traditional visual artists, cultural performances and nonprofit institutions, but also entertainment, fashion, publishing, and broadcasting, which are among the fastest growing export oriented sectors of the American economy. These three states found that the creative industry was the third largest cluster in Arkansas, the fifth largest in Colorado, and among the fastest growing clusters in Mississippi. Those states now consider their creative industry cluster a vital part of their economic development strategy. Their initiatives are being jointly or collaboratively developed and implemented by states' arts councils, economic development agencies, and community colleges and universities. And this is how these states have done it. They launched cultural districts and arts enterprise zones. They created spaces for artists and other creative talent to cluster, interact, and thrive. They've integrated arts, culture, and design into innovation hubs that encourage collaboration. One of the unintended consequences of this pandemic has been a global shift, an acceleration toward digital innovation. 
And that's a transformation that we all have to rush toward. As trade shows and fairs, fashion weeks and showrooms experience severe disruptions. We have seen Fashion Week and Miami Art Basel and even cite them pivot to a virtual model. The future of our export industry also needs to adapt to a post-pandemic world. Transforming Cebu with its existing critical mass of creative talent and industries into an innovation hub requires an infrastructure for online business. Italian economist Pierluigi Sacco identified this culture 3.0 shift as strategic to Italy's competitiveness in post-COVID COVID recovery and beyond. Culture 3.0 is Italy's response to the impact of this pandemic. Pivoting their fashion industry to a digital platform will connect Italian brands directly with U.S. buyers, retailers, press, and end consumers. The Italian trade agency recognized that many companies lack the technology to enable online international trade and launched a new digital platform called Extra IPA Style on September 24. This platform has 80 virtual brand boutiques with individual dedicated brand pages, social media integrations, and video streams to present their collections. A B2B forum will also enable brands to interact directly with buyers and retailers, pre-screened by the IPA. The platform is designed to showcase engaging brand stories, animated 3D imagery with special effects, aiming to engage buyers and retailers through a more interactive experience. Machiavelli said, never waste the opportunity offered by a good crisis. This crisis provides an opportunity to reposition our export industry with a digital makeover. The opportunity to relaunch our exports on a digital platform through social networks and online niche communities has the potential to engage consumers all over the world in a virtual marketplace. I want to end with a few images that I hope will inspire you to think boldly and explore new directions. This is a piece by Aurelia Munoz, a Spanish pioneer of new tapestry art. Her work is focused on the handmade, using her senses as an active extension of the mind to engage the viewer in an interactive experience. This is a work by El Anatsui of Ghana, who employs natives to gather, pound, and weave discarded bottle caps from local distilleries to create dazzling metallic tapestries. From such ordinary materials, he creates extraordinary art. Janet Eckelman's monumental floating sculptures were inspired by fishing nets. Collaborating with an engineer, she created custom software to design porous, dynamically moving sculptures of ultralight twine made of industrial material used for astronauts' spacesuits that can withstand hurricane winds. And here is a video from Mekudeshet, the Jerusalem season of culture, a multicultural, multisensory experience of art, music, dance, with a robotic ibex strolling through the Israel Museum, and 1,500 people dancing silently around Anish Kapoor's sculpture with music from headphones broadcast from a DJ booth at 3 a.m. It's very weird and exciting. I hope you'll enjoy it.
hope we all transcend the challenges of this time together, leaning into our own brand of Filipino ingenuity and resilience to come out of this crisis stronger. More power to you, Cebu. Thank you so much, Ms. Barry. That was inspiring on so many levels, so many levels. And I don't know if you guys are thinking the same way I am, but I am looking at how we can um, adapt or at least um, find a way to make it possible for us to come together um, remotely for Sinulog, because that is our um, iconic festival in Cebu. So creativity can come in so many ways and begin from so many places. My favorite wizard once said, you step into the road and if you don't keep your feet, there's not knowing where you might be swept off to. Our next speaker has, has a long background in economics and political science, working for the Deutsche Bank AG, the UN, the Asian Development Bank, and others. But her passion has always been in filmmaking. She's now an internationally multi-awarded film director of Ang Pagkalma sa Unos, a film about the super typhoon Yolanda. Here we have Ms. Joanna Arong. Good morning, Joanna. Good morning. Um, thank you to Cebu Design Week for inviting me to speak. Um, I'm also from Cebu, my buntat sa tanan. So I'm excited to share my experience basically in the last year. So let me just dive right into it and share my screen. Okay, so 2020 was supposed to be um, really the year for travel for me. It had been 10 years since I had released the film. And finally, my new film, which is in Cebuano, Pagpakalma sa Unos, was having its world premiere in Slamdance Film Festival on January 25th. And, you know, this film actually took a lot of twists and turns and took a long time to make and then to release. And I was ha happy to say that actually it resonated across the world and we ended up winning, sorry. We ended up winning um, the Grand Jury Award for short documentary. And sure enough, our film did end up uh, traveling and it ended up winning other awards, first in Cinemalaya back in Manila and in Bangkok, um, in Mexico City. And just two weeks ago, we won the best, um, the Grand Jury Award again in Hot Springs in Arkansas. Okay, another reason why I thought this year was gonna be a year for travel for me, exactly a year ago, um, we had a, sh uh, sorry, we had a residency in uh, Mexico. Um, I had a, sh a joint residency with another Filipina artist, uh, Melanie Gritska del Villar, and basically, um, Sorry, I'm getting so nervous. Um, we had organized this group exhibition and, and after two months in Mexico, basically we had spoken to the Philippine embassy in, in Mexico and we had thought for 2020, what better way to do than bring artists from the Philippines to Mexico to also exhibit. So after, um, after my time in slam dance, I went back to the Philippines and basically was working on this. And soon after lockdown happened. Um, as a freelancer, I'm basically used to pivoting. So I said, okay, fine, let me work on another project. And sure enough, I had another project. Um, basically another film of mine was gonna be part of a group exhibition in New York. Very exciting because this film was part of a show that I had curated a year ago in, in Cebu for Cube Gallery. And one of my pieces called Sampit Sadagat, again, another experimental short documentary, um, was making its rounds in galleries. So first it was in Cebu, then it went to Chicago, and then back in Manila. And now I was super excited that it was actually going to New York, and in fact had just, um, had just redone the, the sound design for this. And then New York also went into lockdown. So this is a still from, from the show. Um, it, it, because it went into lockdown, the show was actually postponed. And when, when the show was postponed, 
something actually happened all of a sudden i felt like i was completely out of control had you know and it 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 just hit me the whole pandemic hit me and i i kind of froze up and basically just shut down and even the gallery was contacting me for an interview and i i i just couldn't reply to anybody so thank god for netflix i ended up watching just binge watching for like 3 weeks i basically went into a bit of a depression and i think i don't know how many series i watched um i discovered mad men for example all seven seasons i watched in 7 days or 10 days but of course you know you can only watch so much tv and slowly i started getting out of bed i started meditating um i started getting in touch with friends again i finally contacted the gallery again and slowly with friends you know i started connecting by sending little gifts sending little um wine and that helped and then we even um created a a movie club so with friends all around the world so we'd meet every sunday at 9 p.m. and that was a way to really connect again and of course we barely talked about movies it was just about again just connecting and soon after i also came across this this um photograph and it was in the guardian and basically it was on these metal wor- med- medical workers in um laguna in st jude's hospital and something clicked inside of me okay you know what i have no control over what's going on but let's see if we can just contribute in my little way so i contacted two friends in um europe and we started a gofundme page and i decided to put my first two films online for free for voluntary donations and within 2 months you know we were able to raise 173000 and this went towards ppe and we donated this to a local ngo called towns and basically they were distributing ppe throughout the whole country and around the same time also um my new film called 116b university avenue rangoon was accepted um into this international pitching forum and again i was starting to connect to different colleagues around the world to colleagues in 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 docs by the sea in indonesia as well as mentors in new york and while we were preparing for this pitch i realized cuz then you know the whole talks okay how are you going to film this you know cuz this film is basically about um burmese writer in exile who is now based in in europe and we were supposed to film her as she was um launching her burmese translation of her book called um irawadi tango in myanmar so when i started thinking about this how are we going she, the, our our protagonist she's a little girl uh, that's being carried in there and she's now in her 70s and there's no way she's going to be traveling anytime soon so again i hit the pause button and i ended up thinking how am i going to go f- forward with this independent film career So I spent a lot of time on my little balcony here in Salcedo village and sure enough uh to be truth be told 2020 did in the, indeed become a year of traveling not physically but traveling within um I started reassessing my past started reassessing you know everything dreams passions experiences friends family and slowly the dots started connecting you know i went back to basics what is the most important thing to me and it's actually creativity so then for me knowing that creativity was important i decided to have a little bit more discipline and even though my uh, my film pakpakalma sa unos is traveling i said okay admin work was going to be relegated to the afternoons and in the mornings i just wanted pure creativity writing and what not and so the dots started connecting And so when I thought again about um so my film company is actually named about uh, named after my second film the old fool who moved the mountains and when I thought about uh the last 10 years because it's been 10 years since I I um released the film I started thinking okay what other stuff has have I actually done and so I thought you know I've actually branched out from film in the last 10 years and you know I've had a lot of different creative collaborations whether it's in graphics exhibitions space design and even a scholarship initiative um in Tacloban and Giwan called Escuela Hayan and when I thought again about it what what really connected all of this together is storytelling 
and also the spirit of the old fool. So for those of you who don't know who the old fool who moved the mountains is, it's, 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 it's an old character in a Chinese fable who basically um, had this vision. He had these two mountains covering his house and he wanted to move forward. And he said, you know what, this is really, he had this vision of moving these mountains away. So he started picking at these mountains and the wise man said, oh, you old fool, how can you, be, how can you move two mountains away? And, but he kept going and he kept going and um, he inspired his sons and then his grandsons and then his neighbors. And then eventually he inspired the two angels as well who ended up um, helping him move these mountains away. So I think for me, that's really, you know, something that I still hold on to, even especially in these days, in these trying days. Um, so on that note, I would like to share the first minute of my film, The Old Fool Move the Mountains, just to reiterate this little story of The Old Fool. note um, basically the last few months I decided that we're going to branch out from films and do it officially some from old fool films we're actually going to create old fool studio so all our creative uh, collaborations and projects are going to fall under that and I'm happy to say that again in the spirit of the old fool we're actually going to start a podcast um, and we're going to be chatting with different old fools that we've met. And of course, anybody who wants to give us suggestions, please do. And it's gonna be old fools, young and old, and hopefully we're going to be um, interviewing or chatting with old fools from around the world. So I think this is gonna be a really fun venture. And this is Melanie who's in the picture and she's gonna be hosting, um, she's gonna be hosting the podcast. So getting back to my film, Magpapakalma sa Unos, um, just to share with you in case anybody wants to see this, it's still making its rounds and it's in different film festivals happening right now around the US. Um, some of them I've already announced, but some, for example, it's going to be in New York as well as in Hollywood and Hawaii. And happy to say that we're also premiering in Amsterdam, in IDFA uh, next month, which will be our European pr uh, premiere. And as for the other film that I had mentioned um, that normally has only been shown in galleries and museums, Sapit uh, Sadagat, happy to say that I decided to have this included in a very brand new Cebuano Film Festival, which is taking place in Bantaya normally, but again, it's all online. And so you can also watch it on, um, at the Bamasa Film Festival. So thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much, Joanna. That was tremendously exciting. And I'd like to do a quick recall to what, what Mark said yesterday, which was about storytelling, right? In the endeavor of telling the community stories, you inevitably end up telling your own. Thank you so much for that. And thank you for your presentation. I hope everyone finds the time to track Ms. Arum's films and get inspired to create your own. I mean, you know, you've got smartphones, just do little clips, TikTok. Um, again, hold on to your questions as our format will now differ from yesterday's. After our speakers present, the questions will then be fielded, giving you a wider range for your inquiries and comments. So you can ask everyone on the board, not just um, per speaker. So before we proceed to our third 
speaker, we would like to thank our government partners who made Cebu Design Week 2020 possible. The Office of the Presidential Assistant for the Visayas, the Department of Trade and Industry Region 7, the National Commission for the Arts, the UNESCO National Commission for the Philippines, the local governments of Cebu City and Mandawa City, with special mention to Congresswoman Lollipop Owano Dezon. Thank you. These organizations and individuals know that the creative industries in the Philippines have to be supported and cultivated for a stronger economy and a livable society. Now, without further ado, let's go to our third speaker. She is an interior designer who has had an illustrious career working for Beverly Hills development of local resorts and hotels. She has also founded Agrea, a fair trade agricultural social enterprise founded on the sustainable agricultural livelihoods that work on the principle of ecology of dignity. With many tools from different trades, let's welcome Miss Ivy El Mario. Good morning, Ivy. Hi, good morning, Kay. Hi, good to see you again. Thank you. <laughs> Is the volume okay? Yes, we're great. <laughs> Take it away. Take it away. It's all yours. Ivy. Okay, thank you. So I'm Ivy El Mario. I'm the principal of Atelier El Mario. And I am very honored to be part of the Cebu Design Week. Excited to be with Kay, Joanna, and Angelica. Such amazing women. Um, just like Joanna, I also lost my North Star when the pandemic started. And Meditation helped a lot, and of course, Netflix. <laughs> so, having said that, um, let me go to the gist of my talk. I want to cultivate, connect, and create design in a world of flux, just to give context to how we move forward um, in, in the present time. Okay, so what is designing for a world in flux? Next, please. We'll just keep on going. Okay. After the Industrial Revolution is the Knowledge Revolution. And we all know this, uh, of course, Industrial Revolution brought in technology. Technology naturally migrated to the Knowledge Revolution. Next slide, please. But because of internet, knowledge is no longer a privilege for those who study it. The world is truly in flux. We are all on the same page. There is no more hierarchy. Like I said, the internet has changed and turned our world upside down, inside out. We are all on a horizontal plane. It's very hard to have first world, second world, third world anymore because all possibilities are available because of the internet. And I first heard about the internet in California. I used to stay in California. This was 1988. And my friend Shirley Matthews kept on talking to me about that. She, it wasn't called, it, it was the um, highway. Uh, what, what did I tell you? Information, Information highway. So she kept on talking, oh, I, this is going to be so exciting. There will be no more libraries. There will be an information highway. And uh, her enthusiasm moved me. So 40 years later, I can still remember my first introduction to the internet was to the enthusiasm of my friend, Shirley Matthews' um, cuentos about this thing that's coming up, this international inter information, information highway. <laughs> okay, next slide, please. <sighs> What's wonderful about technology is it accelerates inclusivity. And because of this, we can measure, uh, instead of the GDP, we, there is now such a thing as the new prosperity index where wellness and well-being is measured. And they would rather not call it well-being. They would rather call it being well. And what is being well? What are the buzzwords for being well? Okay, it's life enhancing. That's a very nice image, the lungs with the plan. Belonging, place making, place memory. 
what is place memory? What is place making? And these are the adjectives that we have to remember. Place making is visionary. It's community driven. It's function before form. It's sociable, transdisciplinary, dynamic, flexible, transformative, collaborative, and focused on creating destination. With all of this ongoing, tangibles and intangibles, uh, it, 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 it's, it's become a fine line. And um, even the way we watch how entertainment is served to us is different. With Netflix, YouTube, even the way we engage with music has changed because of Spotify. Everything's now intangible. So we have to look at these lenses when we invent ourselves or when we adjust our services to this new world. Next, please. Okay. One of the things that is obvious, and I hope we all felt it, especially during the lockdown, that commercial commercialization is on its way out. Um, with our awakened consciousness, um, there should be an abundance mentality. And we can easily pick this up from the millennials and their values. Millennials value experiences. They value the element of trust. And this is most important. Earning a living is fine while being trustworthy. Whether you are a millennial or a millennial, one who feels like a millennial, our shared experiences through technology, travel, and commodity make us, like milk, homogenized. Let's see. <laughs> I can really move the thing. Identity has become fluid. The context of identity is lost. There's a word now, McDonaldization. You know, and what is that? You'll know if I tell you it's K-pop, it's fashion. You can be anywhere, and you know, the, the same tests of, of characters are there. There's the Uniqlo. There's uh, Zara, there's H&M, there's uh, fast food, fashion. It's one size fits all. So therefore, we have a very important role because the creative industry is the maintenance mechanism of our culture, the substantive aspect of ourselves as Filipinos. Our family, our value system, our language, we have to preserve them. <sighs> then again, of course, we cannot ignore the big world outside. So let's just all be global. Let's look, let's keep on looking global while we are thinking local. Local in design context lies in dynamic transformations, which must be both globally appealing and regionally accepted. So we are going to share with you some of the work we have done in our studio, and we hope that illustrates what GLOCAL is. This was completed in 2014, um, and we did this with uh, Fellas Iguano. We worked very closely with him, Gallego Architects. Uh, this is with Ed and Mariana. So this is for the Astoria Panawan. Um, Ed, uh, for, for, for his convention center, he picked up on the mangroves, and so the mangroves, the mangrove cutouts are, the, is the skin of the convention center. For ourselves, uh, what we did was we just recycled um, form wood and used that as the back wall for our villas. So... Uh, we, we used a lot of timber. Uh, instead of it being thrown away, we just recycled it and uh, added lighting. The, the, I think the boats, the resin boats here, came from Ina, the sun. I'm sure it did. <laughs> so next, please. Um, okay, graphics that allude to the elements of water. Why am I showing this? Because everything here is proudly Philippine made. The tiles are from Machuca. Furniture is from Pampanga because this is 
that's in Palawan, and of course the recycled coconut form form number. Um, we're very lucky to have very close friendship. It's been a two decades friendship with the Nan family, Jeffrey and Vivian Nan. So we are the in-house. <laughs> we're the resident designers for them. We do all of their Astoria. So this is the Astoria current in uh, Boracay. Yeah. So here the design is playful and kinetic. Just wanted to show you because this is a collaboration again. We work here with Vito Selma from Cebu. So the furniture here is both from Cebu and Pampanga because she, um, we always tell our clients that our last resort would be to import from China when we have very, very talented craftspeople, furniture designers. So our studio is very collaborative. So that's why I wanted to show you this because this is indeed a true collaboration. Next slide, please. Current represents an electric brush, feeling that it is bold, bright, and contagious. Wanted to share with you why the colors are bright because Vivian wanted to own color. Her narrative is, if you think Astoria, you think bright, you think color. So that's why she never, uh, and my sister Cynthia's favorite thing is bright colors. She's a truly a happy person. So that's why, that's what we do. Okay, this one is in the works. Um, again, working with Edgar Yaga. This is for the Dusit Princess in Boracay. So what we're showing you are, um, is a presentation uh, that we did during lockdown. Um, happy to tell you that work didn't stop. Luckily, work just continued for us. So a laid-back retreat inspired by Boracay's version of the very famous Ati Atihan Festival in Calibo. This is our sense of local. Looking forward to working with weavers because what we wanted to do was the back wall was going to be a, a, a mobile ta tapestry. They were going to be on rods and they were going to be changing. So you're always seeing different, different uh, images. But they, these are inspired by the the Atiyatihan the masks. Um, here's another close up view of that concept. And um, okay, so our challenge how to be on point, uh, just like our neighbors in Asia, we have to truly embrace technology while we save and preserve our local crafts, our local arts. And we have a lot of them to be proud of. In the spectrum of whatever we create, sustainability is a must. Like Joanna says, we find our soul when we go back to basics. And in America, vintage, and hopefully in Europe, vintage is making a great camp comeback because found objects are your most sustainable resource. And the other thing we picked up from Tokyo is, you know, um, let's not waste too much of Mother Earth's natural resource with packing materials. So let's create intentionally and design for this assembly. Um, thank you so much to Professor Raquel Florendo. She really, uh, in one of the talks where I was uh, a speaker with her, she shared this insight and I mind it and I'm sharing it with you. Thank you, Paul. I'm, I'm Ivy Mario with Atelier Amario. Good morning. Thank you so much, Miss Ivy. Thank you so, so much. It was all your projects are so inspiring. I love that you emphasize sustainability because I feel that, I mean, who's going to clean up our own mess? Kita, right? Yeah. Exactly. So thank you, your amazing work ethic and empathy that you bring to your work, both as an ID and as a founder of Agrea, is inspiring on so many levels. Our fourth speaker has spent more than 30 years working in retail merchandising, product design, product development, and interior design. He spent much of his career in NYC, leading merchandising, product design, and development, as well as some work on commercial interior projects. Live from Arkansas, USA, Mr. Robert Banco. Good morning. Ah, there we are. Um, 
Thank you. Well, that was a great introduction. I'm not sure that I need to add anything to that, but I am uh, happy to be here. And I'm going to talk from a point of view on design, but um, it's funny. Someone asked me this week or earlier this week what, what I'm passionate about when it comes to design. And what I'm passionate about is the problem solving part of it. Um, and there was an interesting quote that I read recently. I'll paraphrase it. It was, does, we don't design for beauty. We good de, beauty is a byproduct of good design. So um, how I'm going to present today is really about um, some of the lifestyle changes and the functional changes that we've had um, as a result of the pandemic um, and what those opportunities might look like. Uh, before I move on to there, I just have to say it's interesting what a small world it is because it's. Um, Someone that I knew from the Cebu vendor community, Lori Bokeron, I could pronounce that incorrectly, who contacted me about coming doing this. But then I realized that our moderator, Tobias, taught at Pratt, and that's where I did my master's. And Angelic and I have had a little side chat because when I first started my career, I was in toys. And I remember um, the company, Rust Berry, and then she just mentioned that she does work with Crystal Bridges, which is right here in Bentonville, Arkansas, for those of you who don't, don't know. And then I was listening to Joanna speak and say that she won an award at the Hot Springs um, Film Festival, which is just a few hours away from here. So it's interesting in this global world, um, back to Ivy's uh, local, <laughs> um, how this is local, but it, but we're we're on this global forum at the same time. Um, I, th just to lead in, I know this is adversity from opportunity. Um, not a new idea because Benjamin Franklin, one of our you know founding fathers, uh, quote from him: "Out of diversity comes opportunity." Um, there are a couple things happening here in the U.S. Uh, as far as behavioral shifts. Uh, um, and there's some data on some of this uh, to, to argue some of this in other ways too. But uh, flight from the suburbs or people leaving cities um, to larger spaces, especially now that they don't need to be in an office. Um, they're also anticipating that uh, going forward, it may be a, <clears throat> a hybrid situation where it's sometime in the office and sometime at home. Um, one of the results of those, so multifunctional rooms, and we'll talk about that. This is just an outline of what I'm going to lead everybody through. Um, outdoor spaces, uh, functions of the home, and I won't get into that. We can get into this in the slides. Uh, behavioral shifts in the home, and then a retail landscape, um, just kind of bringing this full circle of what behavior looks like and what opportunities for design and for uh, interior design as well as product design and retailing. Um, so flight to the suburbs, multifunctional and outdoor space are the two things that I'm going to talk a little bit about here. Um, so multifunctional spaces and a key to point out here as I was, you know, having side discussions before I presented this is larger house doesn't mean larger rooms in the US. Um, a larger house may mean they just have more rooms. Um, so you know, I worked for a company in the past where bigger was better. So all furniture had to be big because they were convinced everybody lived in big houses and wanted big furniture. I don't think that's the case as far as a lifestyle. Um, I do believe spaces need to be more functional than ever. Um, you'll hear a lot of discussion in the design community, especially interior design, whether it's commercial or residential, about flexibility. Um, I threw a few images up here just to show if you really look into these, there's computers out there. There's, you know, a library, there's um, eclectic groups of furniture. So I think there's a design opportunity here for many products. Um, and probably one of the key things is really, how is it multifunctional? What are the storage aspects of this based on some of the new functions that we've brought home with us? Um, outdoor spaces. I believe, you know, for a lot of people, this is their first time with an outdoor space if they left the city and they're now living in you know, a small town or suburbia. And then at the same time, if people have had an outdoor space, it may not have been as important before because they weren't confined to their house and they were able to go out and they were out vacations. Um, there's some interesting, uh, you know, facts 
coming out in the U.S. as far as outdoor spaces. Um, I've spoken to people in three different market areas where to put an in-ground pool is now a year and a half wait. So people are out to 2022 for in-ground pools. But, you know, people have expendable cash. They're not traveling in the same way. They're not going on vacation. So home renovations and outdoor upgrades are certainly um, in their scope now. Um, when we talk about outdoor, don't forget about kids. Um, this is really important. I mean, we, we're going through this virtual learning, no day school, uh, parents working from home, having to take care of their kids at the same time. They need this outdoor space, particularly, you know, if you're in, in the summer or if you're in a climate where, it's a, where it can happen more, more year round. Um, it's how do the kids get a, a space outside? What's the respite for parents and kids as an outdoor space? Um, I think there's a lot of opportunities uh, here, you know, tents and playhouses, which I'm showing. Um, there's also climbing walls, tree houses, outdoor stages. Um, there's a lot of things here. And it's how do we keep kids actively engaged? I think kids are losing a lot by being at home, the socialization aspect is missing and the creative aspect is missing. So, um, so I'm, what I'm calling functional shifts in home. Um, so activities that we're not used to doing at home on a regular basis. So work from home, virtual learning, wellness. Um, and I selected this picture because it probably looks like my desk at a normal time of the day, stacked and uh, I'm probably not wearing a tie. Um, so the open floor plan as we start, and, and as we start to dig into some of, this is really from an American point of view, um, the open floor plan has been, you know, really the trend for a couple of decades. Um, and I'm hearing a lot now that this may not be conducive, that people are working from home, doing Zoom calls, they have kids being homeschooled. Um, so there really is in some of the, um, real estate markets and new home development, people wanting spaces where they can retreat and find quiet time or um, flexible spaces. So how, how can a room open up and then close for some privacy? And I think, uh, so by the way, my interior design business were more focused on commercial um, office spaces and in the office um, space, the idea of flexibility, how do we open up spaces? How do we make, create smaller um, meeting areas when we don't need large meetings? That, you know, that's becoming a real buzzword. So the big question here is, you know, how will design and architecture respond to the new functions of the home based on you know, our, 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 the typology that we have now, which is the open floor plan? Um, work and learning. These are two of the big functions that have moved indoors or into the home. Um, it's like overnight people were working from home and they had children going through virtual learning. And this literally like people were in work on Friday and on Monday, all of this was, was in their house. Um, and I grew through some images in here. I think this is, you know, it's a beautiful space, not typical of most people, but where there's a workspace for kids, there's a lounge area, there's obviously music, Music and books. So again, that idea of multifunctional. Um, one of the things we don't think about, and this is a real, this is um, more in houses than say condos in the U.S., is the thresholds. And thresholds is containment. So this is really the entry to the house. Um, and I was doing some reading, and I added this since we, since, since I originally did the presentation. Um, because this is becoming key as people come into the house, as people leave the house, right? Things have changed. All of a sudden there's masks, there's sanitizing, there's, there's some people wanting to take their clothes off um, or parts of their garments off and leave them in the entry, go right to the laundry and not walk through the house with them. There are a lot of stories about this with, you know, essential workers and medical workers <clears throat> not wanting to bring COVID at home to their families. So they were changing in that area, putting their clothes in a bag and going directly to laundry. So I think there's a lot of opportunities here, storage organization. As we talk about interior design, it's what are the surfaces that can be easily cleaned, disinfected, sanitized. Um, and then again, I'm mentioning, you know, space for mask storage and sanitizing, whatever that looks like, if it's wipes or gels, um, but how, to, how do we do that? Um, Work from home, there's, some, there's a lot of data um, surveys with um, employees and 
the one I found recently was 62% of workers prefer to have a hybrid work from home an office in the future. Um, that's opposed to 12% who want to return to the office and 25% who want to stay home 100% of the time. So it, it really is, if, in, if employees, employers are listening to employees, um, the, the, it seems that we will go to some hybrid situation going forward. That's going to have huge impacts on the commercial side. And I could give you a whole hour on commercial design um, and how this is influencing that. Um, but it's going to have a huge impact on homes. And it's, it's how do we have dedicated workspace? How do we have quiet space? Um, I put these two on this slide specifically because these are small spaces. Not everybody lives in a big space. And I think, you know, in the U.S., there's a misunderstanding, I think, from um, foreigners, people from overseas that think we all live in big houses. And that's not true. That's not true if you're... Um, it's not, it's not true in cities necessarily. And it's not always true if you're outside of the city. Love the image on the right, because that's obviously something that's flexible and can be transformed. Um, so work from home, again, it's, um, some of these are more about how do you have, you know, some of the needs again, coming from the residential and the real estate market are, um, how do you have workspace for two people? Because normally you have two working adults they need a space to, to work. Um, and, and that's the main concern here. And I added this at the bottom. Don't forget about opportunities for technology. So whether it's lighting, headsets, um, the lighting can be integrated into the office space so that um, now that we're on Zoom calls a lot, that lighting can be good and people aren't in shadow and look horrible. Um, little side note, I, I saw something recently, there was something, an article recently in the Wall Street Journal that um, people are probably more women, at least that's what they were talking about. Um, there's an increase in Botox injections because people are on Zoom calls and realized that when they, they're, how fatigued they are and that when they're out and they have a mask on, Everyone's looking at their eyes and their forehead. Um, so I thought that was an interesting, uh, something interesting as well. But I think technology is a, is a huge opportunity here. Um, one of the sort of things, some things in there that were a little out of the ordinary. Um, so work from home becoming work from anywhere. Um, and Tobias, <laughs> he sent me an interesting email to challenge me on this, um, to explain this. So in the U.S., um, particularly for in the middle of the country, there's a lot of people, RVs is a recreational vehicle. It's a camper. There's a lot of people who take campers and drive across country. Um, and when COVID, when our lockdown ended in May, the sales and the rentals of RVs went through the roof. Um, and Thor Industries, which, which makes Airstreams, they had a huge surge in sales in May. Um, I know people who were trying to buy RVs, people who were renting RVs and couldn't get their hands on it. Um, and I've talked to some people where their kids are going to be virtually homeschooled. They can work virtually. So like, why not hit the road instead of st staying in my house? Um, and then for people who are really thinking differently and again, outside of cities, um, I, you know, I wrote on my notes here, the, the she shed has been replaced by the office shed and I'm not going to explain what she shed is, but it's a, it was basically a shed in the back of the house and it was the woman's room where she could go and relax and, and get away from everything. Um, but sheds being installed as workspaces now. Um, so there's, there, I think there are some really fun, unique ways that people can rethink um, this adversity. Um, virtual learning, that top picture is probably where most of my friends are with kids. It's, they're trying to take a Zoom call, they're trying to take a phone call, they're working on the computer and the kids are grabbing, their, grabbing at the hair. Um, I think this struggle is real. Um, it, it is, it's not easy for people to homeschool. Parents aren't used to being teachers. It's a different relationship, um, but I think this has a this opens up a lot of design uh, opportunities for design um, zones for learning. What does the furniture look like? What does the organization look like? And I think you have to think about this in different categories. So p kids in um, you know uh, daycare age versus 
elementary school versus middle school versus high school, the needs for that are very different. So I think there's a huge opportunity here. Um, the other function that moved home is home workouts because gyms were, clo gyms were closed. Um, and we had, uh, sorry, I hear somebody in my ear. Um, gyms were closed. People had no way to work out. So it was setting up garage gyms. A lot of um, studios uh, pivoted to virtual yoga, virtual classes, virtual training. Peloton, which is the virtual training um, bikes, which I believe is in the bottom right and the top right, um, where it's a virtual online biking exercise. Their sales are also doing really well. Um, so again, opportunities for design, opportunities for products here, um, and opportunities to think differently about how gyms support their clients. Um, behavioral shifts in the home versus uh, functions that are added, because I think these things have always happened, um, but they're becoming more and more important. So family night and home cooking. And by family night, um, I'm talking about families are now staying home all the time, or and post post quarantine, they're home more than they used to be. So it's what does the, what are those activities look like? How are they entertaining the kids? Whether that's movie night, um, games and puzzles sold out. When we first went into lockdown here, you literally couldn't get them. And if you went to Amazon to order them, it was like a six week wait for puzzles and games. So it tells you that people were looking for things to do and how to entertain and bring the family together at home. Um, home cooking, sales of cookware, from uh, people I know in the industry have been amazing. Um, freezer sales, yeast and basics sold out. People were baking bread at home. Restaurants are open, but it reduced capacity. So people are still cooking more at home. Um, for me, these are all good things because I, I grew up with family dinners and that was the time that the whole family was together. And I think there was an American behavioral shift where that changed. So uh, retail landscape, um, I'll go through this quickly because I know I'm over right now. Um, the big takeaway here is that e-commerce is winning. Um, and this particularly, because I know we were, uh, I was taking this from a home point of view. Um, I think the, the takeaways here are that uh, home goods and Wayfair are the top of mind destinations for home and Williams Sonoma for the gourmet end of that. Um, the wait, is that up? Oh, sorry. Um, yes, sorry. And the other comment here online, um, e-commerce, e-commerce, e-commerce. Um, someone I know who's in e-commerce at Walmart, which is based in Bentonville, um, said that they had to implement five years worth of strategies in five weeks when everybody went on lockdown in order to get e-commerce to grow and work. Um, so that's pretty amazing that, that the idea of e-commerce um, uh, growing was condensed in that short period of time. Um, a lot of shoppers who weren't convinced they could shop online before are shopping now. I think the challenge here is gonna be, how do you keep them? Will they continue to shop? Um, and again, just throughout some growth, Walmart, 97% increase in e-commerce, Wayfair, 195, I mean, Target, 195, and Wayfair, 83.7. So for those of you who don't know, Wayfair is the place in the U.S. to buy furniture online, and it's at all levels. It's from low end to high end. There's some high end people that won't deal with them. Um, TJ Maxx, which I think some of you know, um, <clears throat> their sales are down. They do not do online, so they haven't been able to make that. So they're, they're slowly making it up. Um, and the bottom thing here was a, a little statistic from brick and mortar that incorporates e-commerce. Um, this is from a particular platform that supports this. But they were seeing an average of 317% increase versus 123% last year from April through June. So those are pretty strong numbers on e-commerce. Um, some things to consider on e-commerce, the categories of furniture, what do people need? Um, I put RTA, so ready to assemble furniture, 
ease of assembly is important. And then the other thing that's really important and a takeaway here is how is it packaged for UPS and ground services so that it avoids freight, extra freight costs. Um, so conclusions, all the things that I just said, focus on new functions of the home, outdoor home office, virtual learning, family events, family dinners, home gym, and then e-commerce, which we just discussed is ready to assemble so that it fits in a small package, um, ease of assembly, and then how do we package for parcel delivery versus truck delivery? Um, and I'm closing here with one quote, which is, if design is to be about how we live better, it also has to be about how we survive. And that was in the New York Times in September. And I thought it was just a, a, a good commentary on where we are um, in our world right now. And I have resources here if you guys are going to share that. And that is the end. Um, so I will mute and turn off and turn this back to the moderators. Thank you so much for that, Mr. Pango. The way the pandemic has rewritten, the manual of everyday living is still so mind-boggling. It's hard to wrap your uh, minds around it. But your insight makes the uncertain a little bit clearer. Thank you. Our panel discussion follows. We know you have burning questions that you've been keeping since our first very amazing speaker. So you can either type in your questions in the Q&A button or raise the hand button, which is also found at the bottom of your panel. So we can turn on your mic and you can ask your questions live. Uh, to help us digest all of the previous four talks and to guide the flow of the panel discussion, I would like to introduce our very illustrious stage moderator who is a member of the American Institute of Architects. He served as professor at distinguished institutions such as Pratt's Institute School of Architecture, Interior Design at Parsons, and was the Dean of Sofa Design Institute in Makati. Let me call on screen, Mr. Tobias Guggenheimer. Uh, Good morning, Toby. Morning. Those wonderfully diverse uh, presentations that represent so many different points of view are going to make it very, very difficult for me to uh, find common ground, but I enjoy the challenge. Thank you. I'd like to start, actually, uh, by picking up on some points that, that Robert made. Um, you really kind of grounded us uh, after the, the more theoretical presentations and the poetic presentations by referring to market challenges, observations, speculations about the future, uh, which may be right, may be wrong, or maybe, you know, uh, both simultaneously, more than likely. But one of the things uh, I'm curious about from your perspective as a person who's been on the, on the retail and marketing side, uh, also with a, a deep and profound understanding of design, is what is the story of the Philippines? Who are the Philippines? from the point of view of the international community. I'm thinking uh, uh, maybe from the perspective of, uh, of the idea of a national brand, for example. You know, I, I come from Switzerland originally, and you know, we have this, we actually kind of commoditized the idea of being Swiss as a uh, you know, homeland for mm -hmm. efficiency. Germany kind of sells you know, technical acumen. Uh, China developed a, a fantastic reputation as you know, a workshop for the world and so on. Um, so for the benefit of, of the manufacturing and design community here in the Philippines, I'm curious whether we actually have a kind of global persona that, um, that represents who we are, or is the Philippines you know, some, somehow a, a bit of an anonymous uh, sourcing center uh, from the perspective of the marketplace? Um, so <laughs> for me, I think to the, to consumers, the Philippines is probably more anonymous. Um, I think as someone who did business there and who's, you know, worked there over the years, um, the Philippines, and it's one of the reasons I put, was putting so much e-commerce in here, um, is because I think the Philippines, at least my experiences in Cebu, um, are that the factories there really target the very high end. Um, you know, they want to do business with Henrodon. Um, and the primary outlet for Henrodon is interior designers and people are, you know, $2,000, $3,000 for a chair. Right. Um, 
that's not going by e-commerce. <laughs> that is coming, coming white glove, you know, delivered sure. into your house. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that while there's a market for that, there's also this huge growing part of the market that's not necessarily low end or moderate, um, but that is being purchased online. Um, so uh, to, the, to the consumers here, I don't know that the Philippines has a brand. Um, it, not in the way that I agree with you, Swiss, Switzerland is just Switzerland's its brand. And we know Japan for electronics and for cars, and we know China as kind of the value proposition. Mm -hmm. right. Hopefully they got a, they're getting past some of the bad quality proposition from there. Um, and, and again, I'll add for the Philippines, for me, it's, it's about the handcraft. So I know when, even no matter what level I was working at in, I knew I can't get, I know I can't get handcraft out of China. Um, I could get handcraft. So I, I, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. I, I, That's okay. I, you know, from my experiences uh, in, in 10 years in the Philippines uh, parallels yours and my understanding also that there is a, a some of, seems to be a kind of a, an anonymity to, um, to, to our culture, which, yeah. uh, you know, certainly uh, I would like to see changed. Um, knowing the richness of, of a culture and, and our offerings. So just in, in a nutshell, what would you do, if anything, to, or what kind of suggestion would you make to the, 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 the creative and the making communities in the Philippines to help elevate the very idea of made in the Philippines as a, a marker for, for quality, for uh, you know, some aspects of, of, uh, uh, of desirability, if you will, to the global marketplace? I don't know if I have an answer for you on that. Um, <laughs> I, I seriously don't know if I have an answer for you on that. Is it uh, that's a, is it, is it that's a tough question. Okay. Um, can, I, I, can I interrupt you there? And then sure. you know, my, and, and let, let me go, please, to, uh, to Joanna, because you are a storyteller, first and foremost, but also, interestingly, with a, with a, a background in commerce. So, you know, my sense is that uh, you having spent, you know, many years in, in that world, uh, have a, a strong understanding of, of how, uh, you know, the impression of value is created. Um, I'm an architect, so I think we share the idea that, you know, there shouldn't necessarily be a, a conflict between uh, value creation, creativity, storytelling. Um, how would you answer that question uh, about the, the relationship between uh, between the intangible, say, the origin uh, of, of, a, of, of the story of a community and the manner by which it's received by other cultures? Wow, that's a tough question. Um, that's my job. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, I'm it's a good question. It's a really hard one. Yeah. <laughs> this is a test. Well, okay, I'm going to relate it to some of the questions that have come to me before in terms of, you know, one of my other panels were saying, oh, you know, we should make, somebody had come up with this notion about film that, you know, we should make a film that's really catered just to the Filipinos or another film that's just catered to the international. And I actually disagreed with both. What I think is um, all of us have very personal, unique stories. So if we can inject that, to whatever it is, whether it's film, whether it's a product, if you can make it somehow unique by injecting your own story and then also being aware of what's out there, I think you end up with something unique to offer to the world somehow. Would you say that, would you say that the goal, and, and this question maybe is addressed to Joanna and to Robert simultaneously, is, is, the, is the, um, the need to simultaneously uh, project an individual story and a, and a cultural story on the one hand, and also in, in a manner that is, is somehow universally um, uh, impressionable or, or, or uh, of, of, of broader global or human appeal. Because it seems to me sometimes that, that you know, we, we don't really make an effort to, um, to, uh, to represent you know, certain realities of Philippine culture in our production, not necessarily, not, not that other cultures don't fall into that same trap. 
In my opinion, it's crucial. It's what makes you different. Um, and that's part of the reason, for example, when I made the shift from, from back then, when I made the shift from, um, from corporate world into film world, I had the choice of maybe going to the West, going to Europe or going to the States. But I decided I wanted to stay in Asia. I didn't want to stay back in the Philippines because at the time, back in 2002, most of the films that I was seeing was a bit of a copy, at least the ones I was seeing. I chose to go to China instead because there was something about the films in China that were incorporating their own culture somehow and emitting it, and yet it resonated with the world. Um, so <clears throat> yeah, I, I think it's crucial that we yeah. dig deep inside to bring out something more personal. And I, I think that's applicable to, to everything. If I can transition over to Ivy and, and look for a relationship between the storytelling that Joanna uh, evolves and the work that you do, you kind of, uh, sometimes I see your work as you know, setting a stage, you know, particularly in, in, in public work and hospitality work. Um, are you establishing in, in your work uh, in, in particularly, particularly in, in restaurants and, and hotel work, are you essentially creating stage sets within which Joanna's characters can, uh, can live their experiences or other characters can live their experiences? Is that a, a kind of a, are you consciously either telling a story or at least framing an environment where the stories can be told? Um, I, I, I think, Toby, um, the, the value of this lockdown for me is a lot of thinking. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the speed and the um, velocity of the projects coming into the studio pre-COVID, um, you, I was only designing from instinct, from doing it so well, over yeah. decades, yes. uh, and the client's brief was um, not that it, it it wasn't archaeological. It wasn't really. It was more commercial in essence, mm -hmm. like get the tourists in. Right. Have, so the narrative was very thin. Mm. Um, but now, after all of these musings and after going deep into myself, I want to start designing from my subconscious and really be more intentional. That's my most honest question. Um, so I, I would even like to see the quality of the, the output of the atelier from here on, because there's so much learnings. Yes. Yeah. So in other words, you are pushing in that direction. It sounds a yes. little bit. Yes, uh, yes, I as, am. as an architect, I struggle with the same question. And I always thought that, yeah. that was my responsibility to listen to those very meager uh, <laughs> offerings of the client. <laughs> And yeah. then flesh out the story, fill in the blanks, and, right. and, and kind of curate an experience. And, and, I, and I have a feeling that you've been doing that for a long, long time, very, very successfully. Yeah. If I can turn to uh, Angelica, um, you know, one of the, uh, I think, um, misconceptions that you immediately uh, pushed off and, and relegated to the dustbin was that you know, culture is, is, is cultural activities, artistic activities, making are, are somehow peripheral to culture. But, you know, you brought, it, you brought it home by stating very emphatically that culture means commerce. And, and for those of us in cultural industry, cultural workers, makers, um, you know, everybody from, you know, the uh, um, policy makers all the way down to the, to the craftspeople. Uh, obviously share that point of view, but I'm not 100% sure that that's, that's broadly accepted, particularly here in, in Philippine culture. I wonder if you can just address uh, that for a moment and the, the manner by which you see the value of, of culture currently um, being supported in the Philippines, not only from a commercial point of view, but also from the you know, broader developmental uh, point of view, and whether you see trends that are reinforcing the value of culture in commercial and social um, uh, aspects moving in the right direction or the wrong direction? I'm gonna give you a global, a global um, pullback. I, I come from Negros and I've lived in New York. I've had five um, 
specialty paper stores in New York. Right. And I was an exporter from 30 years ago. So my perspective is that when we were exporting at that time, this was a very long time ago, the past perception of the Philippine um, export brand, if, you, if there was such a thing at that time, we were beginners, we were so passionate, was that we were the Italy of Asia. That the, mm -hmm. in terms of design and in terms of um, the artisanship, I mean, people like Paolo Navone honed us to be able to do certain things really well and to go for the cream at the top of the market because we couldn't compete with China. And I think the impression of value, the intangible value, in this time, the opportunity is that people don't want to buy from China. They can't buy necessarily from India. They do not like the goods that come from Turkey, but, you know, garments is a different story. But I think that we have to go for what is it that is uh, we can excel mm -hmm. in, a, in a really high value way. Our problem was always our price. We could never meet quantity and price. And so when I was exporting, we just went for really beautiful paper and we specialized in paper. And that's why I carried that theme on to New York. In my stores in New York, our best selling item was a handmade paper made in the Philippines with a technique taught by a Japanese guy who taught a remote, remote village. And it would take like four or five months to produce because when it rained, you couldn't dry it. But we could sell that at $25 to $99. And it was making that kind of a craft contemporary, I think is really important to Robert's point. You know, we're living now in a, a smaller home environment, but to have handmade paper to wrap your lampshades around to use to as backgrounds or placemats or tablecloths. I mean, these were things that are timeless and that continue to be able to find a price value in a way that we can compete. So from the, from the commercial point of view, I think you're suggesting that we shouldn't race to the bottom because that's a... That's There's a no answer. way. I mean, these were what all the experts taught us when we were beginning our um, handicrafts and our export business 30 yeah. years ago. You can never compete at the bottom. Yeah. Philippines cannot be there. So you have to find a way to make the most beautiful things. I mean, the filo di ferro, as an example, you know, these are handmade uh, wires that were yeah. finished in a patina that Paolo Navone sold all over the world, came from the Philippines. From one small manufacturer, she just designed the shapes of it, and they would be in the most expensive hotels, you know. So we cannot go to the bottom. This is not where we belong. But when you think about what's happening now in Africa, if you watch CNN, there's a whole segment always about Africa. Mm -hmm. And through that um, platform, that media platform, they're building the African design brand. They're featuring mm -hmm. African designers, African mm -hmm. cloths, African fashions. And I think that that will change some of the way people perceive that country. And we should think about the same thing when we promote mm -hmm. Philippine handicrafts. Uh, it seems to me that uh, one of the interesting characteristics of the Philippines, and, and I think it shares uh, with you know several other countries, is that we're really not an industrialized nation yet. There are effectively no industries here that rely on on technology, high technology, uh, heavy uh, infusions of um, of investment, and so on. And so, really, to a certain extent, you can say we're a craft culture from the point of view of the kind of industries and products that we're talking about. Making paper, not exactly a new craft. You know, carving wood and making furniture, not exactly a new craft. Um, design itself. I mean, when I, uh, when I ruminate about architecture, you know, I, I think, well, um, maybe the studio of, uh, of uh, Vitruvius, who wrote that book, 10 Books of Architecture, 2,000 years ago, probably very, very much like mine. You have a bunch of desks and drafting tables and, uh, and charcoal pencils and, and, and the issues that, that that, that we worry about um, are probably roughly the same. I think the same is true in, in the work that every designer, every maker um, in, in, in our culture probably uh, experiences similarly. So um, Robert talked a lot about the future from the perspective of the market. We haven't yet really talked about the future um, 
from the perspective of so, of industrial uh, advances. Uh, Ivy talked a little bit about uh, you know the the impact of technology and 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 some of the images uh, represented by various uh, speakers kind of hinted, say, at AI and, and digital manufacturing and so on. But the reality is that that's not really a, a, an important part of the landscape here. So would it be fair to suggest that the past, our past, is, is really the key to the future? And that this interregnum that we've just experienced and we're still experiencing is a moment where we can really reflect as a culture about what we're really good at, and use that in, uh, uh, to, to leverage a future, perhaps with, with the help of, of, you know, of 21st century technologies, but that fundamentally we're not really a 21st century uh, artistic or craft culture. And maybe I'll address that to, to Robert looking from the outside and, um, and to Angelica from looking at it from the inside. Um, you have tough questions. <laughs> no, it's good. Um, you know, as I listen to all this, I, I think we're, we're, st we're still back to, you know, what's the perception of, of the Philippines and what's your brand, your brand, what does it represent? Yep, to a certain extent. Uh, that's true. Yeah. And, and I'll, I'll go back to Angelica and, and it's what I was starting to say is like the hat you're, you're right. Going back to the past is good. And it's, and I know there's a huge history of design and there's a huge history, whether it is furniture or textiles or fashion um, in from the Philippines. And, but, and that, that is important to build a brand, right? Because it's not that you're emerging tomorrow and all of a sudden you're design centric. You have a lot of DNA there. Um, it's interesting you just start talking about this because that little side story, there was, um, it was Rita Moreno when she won her Oscar for West Side Story. She wore the dress recently. She was in the Philippines and found out she had to go to the Oscars and bought a dress by a Filipino designer. And that's what she wore. Right. So, <laughs> so it's interesting. We're going back to like 1959, 1960 or something. Sure. So it's interesting that as far back as that, you have a history of design and fashion and people recognizing it. Um, I think, you know, much like I agree with Angelica when CNN does the whole Africa series, it brands Africa. It brands Africa, um, and 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 I don't know what you guys need to do to get behind branding the Philippines as an amazing center for design. Uh, that's really a central question. I'll I'll, I'll bring that over to Angelica. Yeah, <laughs> I'm going to pick up from where Robert um, ended with a story of a dress. When I met Alice Walton of Walmart, the first story she told me was, you know. My favorite dress is from this, a gift from my Filipina friend, Joanna Dasis, who gave me this embroidered dress from the market. And she wears it to her cocktail parties and everything. And when I think about our brand, you know, we have to go back to our cultural context, as uh, Ivy was saying. You know, we have to, uh, I, I want to be specific to say that Negros always had like a different kind of lifestyle value. And Cebu has always had this sense of uh, a, a lifestyle, even in the way they they specialized in furniture. Right. And uh, as far as the past being the key to our future, you know, we we have to remember who were the successes in the furniture industry, and and how can we bring modern technology, quote unquote, not AI, not robots, but handicrafts that were able to upgrade materials. I think we have to focus on our materials. We're seeing Ashenda crafts creating woven fabrics that are now resilient for the outdoors. We see the Dawn took their woven furniture and created a German, through German, I think, technology, something to upgrade it for yeah. wear and tear outside. We've seen in my time, the Capiz industry through a German um, manufacturer in Cebu, upgrade it with resin so it the, the breakable uh, quality sort of improved and now you can really make all these lamps that don't arrive broken 
And when you saw the Janet Eckelman sculpture made of like a fishnet, that was fishnet that she saw in India. And she yeah. just used something else that was upgraded fibers from high-tech industries to do the same thing. And I think we should try and do that and uh, figure out a way to be innovative within our own specialty. You know, while still while, while still retaining uh, the our own the character. Yes. Yes. Uh, excellent. Maybe I'll. I'll uh, I'm not exactly sure how much time we have before we entertain the the questions from the audience, but I want to go over to Ivy for a moment. Um, talk about something that that was mentioned briefly. I think in the introduction, you didn't really talk about it. Uh, but yes. something I'm very interested in the the idea uh, of your of your uh, of your foundation, I guess it is the ecology of dignity. Agree, yeah. you know, yes, we yes. have to we have to admit, you know, the difficult truth that there are a lot of inequalities in yes. not only in the Philippines but many many countries around the world, and it's n not really often that the design community has an opportunity to make a big impact um, on on so say social policy that that can help ameliorate that. So I'm very interested in in what led you to uh, to initiate the uh, this this effort, and to what extent does it actually, in addition to helping perhaps to ameliorate poverty through fair trade, to what extent does it also support um, the evolution and the strengthening of design? Okay, thank you, Toby. I thought my question was going to be the one where you say, um, I have a question for Ivy, but there's no more time, so I'll save it for you. There's always time for Ivy, question sorry. question I was hoping for. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, uh, Agreya happened. Uh, Joanna said, uh, really, we are connected and relationships should be our world. So when Cherry Atilano entered our lives, uh, she became the founding farmer of Agrea, uh, since she was 12 years old, her advocacy has been helping farmers because she grew up in a hacienda. When she entered their lives, we sort of adopted her, my husband and I, so she's now our honorary daughter because we only have sons. Um, we brought her to uh, an island in the Philippines called Marinduque, where my husband's family has a lot of, uh, sorry, Presence. empty land. Yeah. <laughs> empty? <laughs> so, uh, she said she wanted to prove a theory that there could be such a thing as a one island economy. The mm. backbone will be farming. And we engaged for two years. We did nothing but community development mm -hmm. so that uh, we engaged farmers and fisher folks because we wanted to dignify the farmers. Uh, we changed the narrative. Storytelling is so important. Uh, they are now stakeholders. Uh, we graciously booted out, gracious and booted in the same line, middlemen, uh, because with our stakeholders, we bring the, like for instance, turmeric directly to market. And what we do is we um, form them into communities. We advance the sales. So they're, they're given like salaries while they're doing this. And then when it's sold, we all get paid back. So we really changed the narrative so that, we also made them beyond farmers. We gave them literacy, financial literacy. So just stepping up the game. And all of this is just because really of Cherry Atilano. And Young and I have the heart. Really, we've always had the heart to, to, to give back. So it, at the third quarter, how would I say? My third act, this came into my life. And uh, where will art come in? We said that... Um, na, um, Agrea became very attractive also to investors because there, it was a confluence of, uh, it was a synergy of strengths. As an interior designer, our farm and our homestead was always above par. So people were always interested. And as soon as they entered, the ambiance was different. But then a few, uh, half a mile down is an amazing farm. So then we decided, okay, this is a good prototype for leisure farms. And then we're going to engage the community of women to do crafts. So I have been the supposedly artistic director of, 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 of the crafts making of our women community, of, in our, of our women communities, but have not had the time to flesh that out yet. Because like I said, this is the time for reset. I was just in my 
design bicycle trying to right, beat my deadlines. Right, right, right. But now that it's 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 part of the intentional design moving forward. So yes, Agrea is very, very dear to our hearts because it's really changing lives. Excellent. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think it's actually heartening that most of the most of the people on our panels have actually uh, become deeply engaged in. Uh, I hate to use philanthropy, but you know, kind of community building uh, efforts that really illustrate the the spirit, the communal spirit. Of, of the design community that I have always recognized, um, but you have managed to put into practice a, uh, the desire of many, uh, many in the design community to impact uh, society in a, in a broader sense than simply having a relationship, you know, satisfactory relationship between themselves uh, and the client. Now, uh, Joanna, you're a little bit of an outlier, I guess, in the sense that you you are a storyteller, uh, where the rest of us make stuff. You know, we in, in order in order for our work to become manifest, uh, you know, we have to chop down trees or, at the very least, recycle trees that have fallen down <laughs> by themselves. But but we take you know uh, the nature of our work, the nature of the maker community is to take stuff to take pieces of the world, chew it up and digest it and, and, and turn it into, into something. So we have a very impactful relationship. Um, and uh, the, the storyteller, I think, is kind of at the top of the food chain because without the stories that we tell, all of that digestive process is not going to, is not going to end up evolving into, into a, a product that was worth the effort you know, both personally, financially, socially, and maybe even politically, which is another topic maybe that uh, we, we should address very, very, very uh, quickly. But I'm, I'm curious from your perspective uh, as a storyteller who's kind of involved in the life of people uh, struggling to, to survive, uh, often by, uh, by making things, um, uh, do, do you see yourself and people like you as, as kind of the anointed leaders of the 21st century, uh, you know, cultural evolution? Can we live without the storyteller or should we all be kind of, um, you know, worshiping at your feet collectively and, and, <laughs> and remembering that everything that we do has to be framed by a story, either our personal story the story of our client, the story of our culture, um, or in some way uh, be given meaning and personality through, through a, an initial evocation of a narrative? A simple yes or no will do. <laughs> mm -hmm. Another really tough question. But, <laughs> but as I mentioned- He warned in, us. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> As I, as I mentioned in my talk a little bit, really all of us are storytellers. And in fact, I kind of forgot my own story. So I think um, for me at least, this time was a great chance for me to really look at my own story from the beginning and, and really feel like, you know, think about what's most important to me. And again, as what Ivy said, you know, um, I use that word a lot. Like I do things with intentionality now. Yes. Who I spend time with, you know, who I'm going to collaborate with. Yes. So, so I think all of us are are good are storytellers, and and it's a great time to rethink everything we've gone through, and and um, I can't say better than what Ivy said. Again, to do things with intentionality mm. and to tell our stories with whatever whatever we end up doing. Yes. Whether it's film, whether it's architecture. I, I feel spaces have a lot of stories. Oh, absolutely. Well, you're preaching to the converted. In fact, uh, I was intentional <laughs> in my own career. I, I took a degree in English literature and writing before I, I, I went to architecture school purely because of that reason. And I thought that without a story, you know, all of our human endeavors um, can be kind of, uh, you know, become perfunctory um, uh, rather than, than intentional. So I, I know that we have, okay, we have some questions from some folks out there in the ether. 
I'm going to be reading out some of them that okay. have come okay. in. So um, some of them are directed to everyone. So when that happens, you can give a very brief um, answer. Some of them are directed to specific panelists. So, all right, this is for everyone. How have the challenges related to COVID-19 forced you to think differently in your field? Did you feel like leaving it at some point? Or do you feel like coming back to it? And what opportunities have presented themselves? Just very briefly. Anyone can? So I'll, I'll start. Yeah, go right I, I've, I've had to, um, so pre-COVID, there were some projects, to, uh, office, not home, not in residential, but for offices, some proposals that we had out there. And realizing, again, some of the things that we talked about in my presentation with people working from home and not in the office as much, redefining what does office space look like. So, and a lot of things are leaning towards smaller offices, many more meeting areas for, for smaller groups of people instead of large meeting areas. Um, how are we controlling circulation better? How are we keeping open areas so that people aren't in close contact with one another? So we've really had to go back and do that. Um, and it's tough. <laughs> it's really tough every day, um, especially because, you know, our focus is offices and no one's in an office right now. Right. So I'm out there. I, you know, hitting meetings saying, no, do this now, because when you're ready next spring to bring people back, you'll be ready for it versus bring people back and then have to make decisions. I think it's really difficult, but we, we just have to search harder for, for, um, for opportunities. And, you know, someone said to me, which I think is true, I think as designers, this could actually add more value to the services that we bring to the table. And I think we always have to have that lens on this of, hey, in some, in some situations, they'll actually need this and they're actually going to need our expertise, but it's our expertise plus our kind of post-pandemic, post-COVID knowledge and insights that we bring to the table. Right, right. If I can uh, um, inter interject for, uh, for a moment, I think to me, that's a very, very interesting question. And I, and, you know, I, I know that there's kind of a collective angst in the world about the sudden change uh, to, to our environment, professional environment, personal environment. But, you know, we are designers are, are by definition, people who respond to a given moment, a given situation, given opportunities. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I think we have to remind ourselves of that that this just happens to be the given moment. And the challenge that we now face is just a little bit different than other challenges we have faced before. But if we cannot rise to the occasion from a creative point of view, from a business point of view, from a cultural point of view to this moment, then we really should, I think, um, you know, wonder whether we're in the right business. Mm. <laughs> We don't. We really don't have an excuse. We always, yeah, yeah, yeah. always have to rise to the occasion. Mm, true. And um, when when you recognize when you recognize that responsibility, and you recognize that this is what you've been training for, and practicing all your life, all your professional life, then embracing the the opportunity um, that this good crisis presents, as uh, Angelica reminded us. Uh, then you can really actually retain the sense of optimism that we designers are known for. Absolutely agree. Mm -hmm. Ivy, oh, okay. would you want to yeah. answer that? Yes, a yes. Bit? Yeah, yeah. Very, very quickly. Yes, yes. Um, it was also validation because uh, we delivered amazing homes to clients, but they were also so busy to appreciate it. Um, now that they spent time in their homes, we're, we're really getting phone calls and saying that the journey, the design journey was worth it. All the thinking that went into the purposeful environments that we made was really now being enjoyed. So that, that's a great caveat. I mean, it, it puts a smile to your face. Mm. Um, the other thing was very briefly, I also, I've been a hardworking girl since my 20s. So I always said to myself, in my next life, I'll be the client. 
so well. I had a four days. I was on Netflix. I was just eating. I wasn't doing anything. <laughs> That's so, right. Check that off the list. Yeah. But let's go. <laughs> yeah, we have a lot of hard work to do here on out. Yeah. Um, Angelica and maybe really quickly uh, Joanna. Um, I think that uh, resilience is important. I mean, we have to. We have that resilience. I always say the reason I picked a mascot for a of a carabao in Negros is because resilient. it's hardworking. It keeps plodding along, and I think that Filipinos have managed to survive through thick and thin when the export industry was really down wow. and i've seen all that and i think the most successful companies have been those who could create a narrative around a craft and i think that mm -hmm. when you see how people have done it whether it's um I'll, I'll give an example of Ashanda Crafts. You know, it's a place-based, context-focused kind of a destination in Rosalia where you you can see people who do make those lamps in a place that has some culture and heritage. And that's what I'm trying to do in Negros. When, when I'm launching this season of culture, I'm trying to weave together a narrative under which a whole uh, slew of different enterprises, whether it's... Um, Visayan cuisine, uh, food, culture, religion, music, arts, rondalias, you know, all the things that make us unique, but they need uh, an umbrella. And so creating a, a home story, I think, is the most important thing. So, Joanna, you're right. We all have to be storytellers. If we want a business that can build a brand, not just for ourselves, but for our province and for our country and I think always going back to our cultural perspective is so important I think the our old fool and your carabao should get together at some point. <laughs> yeah no in terms of um, me you know I, I I haven't given up on film at all and I'm still actually still pitching to get grants etc but I'm also just very pragmatic and realistic and so it's sort of in the backdrop and I'm now um, sort of not reinventing but just pivoting again for that word and just working on other things that is still about storytelling still you know um, using creativity somehow and as I mentioned you know we're going to start this podcast now looking for old fools so I may be calling one of you guys. Love it. <laughs> the fool so is actually love it, love it. Yes, yes. The yes. fool is actually the most coveted tarot card because it really yes, it is it's because, the wise um, one, the wise yeah, fool. Right? More like wise he's fool. open to all the possibilities mm, and true. therefore able to shape themselves into whatever is demanded of them. So interestingly enough, so here's one for Miss Ivy. Um, oh. Last one. Okay. okay. Do you experience resistance from developers or owners of projects for your preference for local material? No. And local designer. Okay. No, no. Sorry. Luckily, we're all on the same page. Yes. That's wonderful. No, no resistance. Okay. That's very, very good to hear. Thank you. Yes. Okay. This is especially good to hear for um, people who are watching this seminar right now, um, who are also designers and interior designers. Um, so that they could make that full pivot to, um, you know, prioritizing local designers and you know helping get the economy up on that end. Okay, this is from Debbie Palau to anyone. So anyone. Okay, why do you think the clients are providing you with thin and meager base story? Is this the lack of cultural appreciation you think? And how can you um, change that narrative, as it were? From my experience, I, 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 I don't think it's um, intentional. I think that, uh, you know, I, I think this pandemic is like World War II. It, it, it affects us so much. I mean, post-pandemic, pre-pandemic. It's just because of our business. The, the the ROIs were so were so important. Our business just made the, na the narrative very thin because there was not enough there was no time for awakening. There was no time for deep introspection. So I think the stories that will come out after this, even with our clients, because this is happening to all of us individually. We're all experiencing this. So our stories are going to change, and I'm already beginning to see it. it narratives are getting deeper. That, that's right. my most honest 
quest uh, answer to that. Yeah. Right, right. So May I, I also think uh, that in, in you have to recognize our expertise. Uh, we, we are trained to think as designers, clients or not. And to, to a certain extent, they, a client is generally limited by what they have seen, what they have known, what they have experienced. Mm -hmm. And quite often clients will come to you uh, with uh, sometimes literally a book, a big thick book, uh, which is essentially just a book of preconceptions. It's a, it's a book of plagiarism. It's things that they have seen, things that they've experienced, things that they believe represent bits and pieces of a solution. And so my feeling is you, the client is really not the person to give you the instructions. That You are the person meant to lead the client. And I think many times designers, especially young designers, um, are, are, don't have the, the confidence perhaps to do that or don't recognize that that's actually their responsibility. So when you sit down, talk to a client, you have to ask them the kind of very, very difficult questions that I'm asking our panelists today uh, and listen very carefully for clues uh, that can help you lead the project. And so if a, if a client, certainly an architect or an interior designer, doesn't present to a client a solution that causes them to say, oh, I never would have thought of that, then you haven't really done your job. So I think it's really a question of leadership we have to we have to buck up. We have to be very confident. We have to listen. We have to interpret. We have to curate. Um, and in that respect, we can offer leadership in the process that ultimately the client will appreciate. There is a lot of translation and interpretation work going on. So very there's much. there isn't a big difference between you're translating from an original language to a, to a new language than what we're doing as designers. Because sometimes they don't know what they want. So That's we have to sort of let them know about it. All right. So here's another one. Okay. Um, Miss Angelica Berry. Being involved in both creative pursuits and in commerce, I guess this applies to Joanna as well. How do you balance your creative and analytical side? Do they occupy the same space or do you give time for each of them? Do they clash? How do you balance that out? I think you have to be clever in balancing things out. When we were in early in exports, one of the things that I learned from these consultants was that you have to have your own unique point of view. You know that people come to you, as Tobias said, because you have a kind of taste. You know, they wouldn't come to you uh, to be a a vendor or a supplier for them, unless you have a unique point of view. And I think the most important thing about that point of view is being able to, to project what's your point of excellence. You know, so I, I always say if the more specialized you are, you may turn off the general, the generic kind of buyers, but you have to have a point of view. And so the other lesson I learned was that you have to have, um, you have to be willing to create lost leaders. You know, I would design a line of paper mache jewelry and I would have one that was so out there that I know that's not the one that's going to sell the most, but that's the one that's going to make people wake up and say, that company is different. And uh, that's how I met my husband, by the way. <laughs> I had paper jewelry <laughs> that his buyer told him, you, got, you have to see this company. And I met him, he couldn't get his price, and so he had to marry me. And I think that that's, uh, <laughs> that's the way I balance. You know, some things you can't balance with price, some things you can't balance with creativity. You have to find something in between. And so I think that you, you have to be willing to take those kinds of risks to do something bold or to do something more in a large-scale way as opposed to just being nondescript and uh, generic, you know. Right. If I can just add a quick postscript, I think the question implies that there's a tension between creativity and profit, and I don't think that's true at all. Going back to Mr. Um, oh. Oh. Excuse me. I mentioned Marcus Vitruvius uh, uh, earlier, and he had this uh, adage that we still refer to today that a successful design um, presents utility, firmness, and delight. 
there's no conflict between it has to be beautiful, as Robert mentioned, has to be has to be strong, has to do what it has to do, um, and it has, has to be to technically delight. appropriate. And maybe in today's context, we might also add profitable. Mm -hmm. uh, absolutely no no distinction. We shouldn't ever uh, we shouldn't ever hesitate to to support, advocate, celebrate uh, the economic value of the work that we do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Agree with that. And I suppose to whoever asked this question, if you find yourself a little bit leaning to one side or the other, it's not a bad idea to get yourself a team. Surround yourself with people right. who don't have your strengths or who can back you up, who can compliment you because um, all great things take a village. All right, one last thing for Mr. Robert Panko. All right, despite the tragic loss of lives and employment, do you think the pandemic will have a positive impact in your career. Wow, <laughs> what a setup with the tragic loss of <laughs> lives. Um, and, and yes, yeah, so the loss of lives is, is tragic. Um, and it's, it's, it's a tough one. It's a tough one to, uh, it, it's, just, it's just difficult. It's difficult to follow the numbers and, and follow all that. Um, I do, but let's, I, I wanna be clear. I, you know, I'm in a state right now where I am weathering the storm. Um, and I think all of us have had that moment and whether we're coming out of it yet or not, we all went into this similar to Ivy saying, you know, all of a sudden there weren't as many proposals on the table. So she started thinking differently. Um, the answer to the question is yes, I do. But here's the reason why. The reason why is because I'm passionate about what I do. The reason why is because I have a thirst for knowledge about what I do. And the first two weeks of the pandemic were locked down. I was watching the news all day and I was just sitting on the sofa eating and not wanting to leave the house because it was so depressing. And there was a moment when I woke up and thought, I have to stop. <laughs> I need to stop. I need to limit the news. I still watch it and read it, but I limit how much I have. Um, and then I discovered that during pandemic through um, design associations and AIA, the Architects Association, there were all of these online CEUs, all these continuing education classes, seminars and um, panel discussions about design and its global leaders that were on these panel discussions discussing what their thoughts were on design post pandemic. Um, and they were, some of them were fascinating. Some of them I'd listen for an hour and get one takeaway, but they dug in more than design as, as interior design or architecture. It started with, <clears throat> and back to how do we design, right? We start with the problem and the problem was the pandemic. The problem is how does that affect the organizational structure, the organizational behavior and the behaviors in the building? And then what does that mean to design and how does design inform, how does that inform design and how does design support these new functions? And I apply the same thing when we're talking about residential. So yes, I do. And I, I you know, I'll repeat what I said before. I think this is a new set of problems, but I think all of us that are in design fields will now be needed more to solve those problems because it's not, it's not easy. It's not easy the way it was before. Right, thanks so much. Mr. Guggenheimer, if you could synthesize everything for us for this morning's takeaway. Now that's a, a, a very, very tall challenge given the, the breadth of the perspectives. Um, you know, I suppose the, the thing that ties the uh, the the observations of, of everybody uh, on the on the panel and also also the questioners is is more kind of the fundamental uh, relationship of society to design than the relationship of the design community to the pandemic. I mean, I think there's a sense that the pandemic obviously is a a unique experience um, in global humanity, um, at least for our time, it's happened before, but there's a quandary as to how we can prepare for the future. Is the future going to seem very, very different, a little bit different, uh, not different at all. 
um, and and we in the design community, like people in 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 all trades and industries and, and cult cultures and and, and countries, uh, have the same question. Um, and I think there is, in, in my my personal belief, is that you know the the resilience of human spirit, um, the patterns that society and uh, and civilization have evolved over the centuries. Are not are, are quite resilient in and of themselves, and are really not going to change all that terribly much. And that, uh, that, that generally speaking, we're going to probably enter a future that's you know, very recognizable. But I don't know if if, if that's the case. Um, but listening to to Robert's closing remarks uh, makes me um, uh, ma uh, makes me confident that we in the design community, we in the maker community. Um, have a kind of our, our fingers on the pulse of of the moment, but when you you really think about uh, what we are being asked to produce um, in the context of this unique moment, it isn't fundamentally different from what we've been asked to produce in the past. I mean, the ergonomics haven't changed of the human body. the The work that we do hasn't really changed. The location maybe has changed. So um, the, the stories that we thirst, that Joanna is telling, they haven't really changed. I mean, for, for millennia, we've been telling the same stories about struggle, about, about finding you know, strength uh, to overcome adversity and so on. The desire to work with our hands and, and to produce the kind of products that Angelica uh, and, and does, those, you know, those are, are, are almost, you know, uh, part of our DNA now. The, um, the need to shape the vessel within which we live uh, that Ivy produces uh, in her work, you know, that, that hasn't uh, fundamentally been challenged. The desire to create those kind of spaces that are somehow both physically and spiritually evocative. So, you know, given that we don't know what the future will bring, but we can predicate some pretty valid guesses about what the future will bring by uh, reminiscing about our very recent past and, and about our more distant past. Um, and also, given the, the natural optimism of, of a designer and a maker, I mean, we are driven to make things that are responsive to the moment. Um, uh, my sense is that we're going to come out of this as a community of creative people um, relatively well. Hopefully uh, this will end soon, but in the meantime, I think it's our obligation uh, to continue to try to make contributions uh, in the crisis while at the same time uh, preparing for the next step um, in, in our cultural lives, both locally and globally. Thank you so much, Thank you. everyone. That has been opportunity from adversity, from the perspective of individuals and creatives. I hope you learned as much as I did, and I hope you're just as inspired as I am to push forward nonetheless. Do not forget to check out and submit your entries to the Blue Mango Awards. That's about 200,000 pesos prize money. So translate your stories into crafts, work with your hands, and get making. In our day and age, design is everywhere, and creativity can be found in every one. To celebrate this fact, and to help creatives remain pesotive. This year's Blue Mango Awards, will pivot, into timely and relevant categories, that emphasize creativity in our daily lives, and encourage productivity while in quarantine. Over 200,000 pesos in cash prizes, await the 24 winners, which will be announced in December 2020. The new deadline is now set for November 25, 2020. Entries are open to anyone from the Visayas. For more info, please visit our site, or email us at the address indicated below. We would like to thank, Cebu Landmasters, and Smart Communications, for their generous support. We look forward to receiving your entries. Thank you, stay safe, and stay creative. Stay creative. Even our plantitas, plantitos and home cooks who have unleashed their creative potential over quarantine can join in the fun. 
Don't miss the next three sessions of the Design Summit. That's this afternoon, tomorrow morning, and tomorrow afternoon. They're two very interesting themes for us, for the creative industry to move forward amidst these challenging times. This afternoon will still be opportunity from adversity, but from the perspective of organizations and enablers. And on Wednesday, it will be rethinking tomorrow or what story can we write for the future? Thank you all for attending. Tag us on your social media posts and let us connect, create, and cultivate. I'll see you all after lunch. Stay safe. Thank you. Sudunga nga tung dak bayan nang inahang la hugtabang nagbago ud sa kadaghan sa kalisod nga kisaguban unta di na nato ni pasagdan Walay di masulbat kung talan Magkahit mo sa lang Sa pagpagkamalang Alang sa usag-usa Kitaragyod ang atong kaluwasan Kayang gahong anak
sa pamana di ah 